Well, thank you so much, everybody. I didn't get a chance to meet all of you, but I hope to be able to do so afterwards. I, I love to get to know who you are and what you do and where you're coming from. Um, this is such an honor to be here today for so many reasons. Um, FinCon is something actually I've been looking at for years. I'm like, FinCon is amazing. I want to come. I'm sure many of you feel this way. How many of you are here for the first time at FinCon? Wow, amazing. My people, we are all here together. <laughs> so this is going to be a complete new experience for all of us. And you know, PT asked me to speak. I was so honored. And I hope to be able to share something with you today. Well, for those of you who don't know me yet, I thought I would jump in and maybe tell you a little bit about my, myself. And when you get bored, you can raise your hand, and I will move on. All right? <laughs> is that a deal? Also, this is a presentation on social media, which means I do not get offended if you have your phone up or if you are taking pictures or doing whatever you need to do because I will actually love you more, all right? So feel free to tag, to post, to do whatever you need to do because that is what I embrace. If you want to tag me, I'm happy to be tagged. Um, you can tag me at Sun Group WP, and I'll retweet it and share it with my follow, my my tribe, if you will. Today, I think I'm at 275,000 followers on Twitter. So um, it may sound like a big number, but I'm going to teach you how to get there today, which will be fun, right? All right. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Winnie Sun. I am a financial advisor by trade. I've been doing this for almost 17 years, believe it or not. But much of my time these days is spent not only with clients, but also doing multimedia activities. So to give you a kind of a full scoop, as you can tell, unlike Matt, I actually look Asian, Matt. Um, so I am Asian. I am a descendant of parents from Taiwan who back in the day came to the United States with not a lot of money, typical immigrant story. They were absolutely incredible savers, though. And that was kind of cool. Like, as a kid, I mean, if we had a 39-cent burger from Burger King, I was like, yes, that means we had a good week, right? Those were special times. And they were incredible savers. They moved us to a better neighborhood. I was about to go to a school where there weren't drive-by shootings, which was a big, big thing. And I thought, wow. This is getting to be like the good life, right? I'm actually going to be able to eat lunch outdoors. This is so great. And then all of a sudden, about three to four months before heading off to college, I was a typical Asian kid, right? Great SAT, great GPA, because that's all we could do. <laughs> couldn't date, couldn't have sports. We could study. Um, so about three to four months before starting college, my parents went bankrupt. They were pulled into bankruptcy because they invested in a real estate project with some of their friends and really didn't know how to save, they didn't know how to invest, and so that's what happened. And so I ended up um, going to a state school. I ended up not going to private school. Like, I was supposed to go up north to a really nice private school. That didn't happen. I ended up going to UCLA, and during that time, I started working right away, like many college kids do, not only to pay for college, but also to help mom and dad keep the house. And that's how my journey started. Started working in television, um, working at Jones and Jury, a legal talk show. I was supposed to do legal research because that's what Asian kids do. Um, <laughs> nothing too dangerous, right? Um, but of course, the first day I got there, they're like, Winnie, no legal research. I'm like, oh. They're like, but we need help in the audience. I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun, the audience, right? So I started working in audience, and my job was somebody called a page. If any of you have ever been at a live television taping, the page is a glamorous role of walking you to the audience and to the restroom, and then back to the, your seat. And I would then collect gum from each of you. It was a very highly desirable position, and I did that for a little bit. And then eventually, they started paying me $5 an hour, and I was like living the life. And then at some point, they even let me be the last person to visit craft services. So life was getting amazing really fast. So during that time, I did that, and all of a sudden, you know, opportunity existed. One of the producers came up to me and says, Winnie, if you start your own company, I'll send you all my shows, and I'll send you my daughter's shows. I said, cool, I'll start a company. So I went to Staples, I bought myself a used on-display fax machine, and then in my college apartment, I started a television audience production company. And then from there, I handled America's Funniest Home Videos, and Will of Fortune, Jeopardy, and MTV Pilots, and the list went on and on. And in no time, very, very quickly, we became one of the most um, 
one of the most in-demand television audience production companies in the United States. So I was moving thousands of people every single week for days. And so from there, of course, I was thinking I was living the life, right? Um, I was moving people, I was getting paid a decent amount of money, and then I bought myself a salvaged BMW, and life was amazing. I went to the police auction and spent $6,000 and bought myself a BMW. And I told my mom, like, this is good life, right? This is what I went to UCLA for. And then my mom's like, no, you are a failure. You are an Asian child working in television. You are nothing. Like, oh. <laughs> oh, this is really sad. But she is, true. she is totally right. I was like, okay. So what should I do? So I said, okay, well, my parents didn't know too much about financial planning, so maybe I should get to be a financial planning person. I should know something about financial planning. Only as a hobby, only as a side hustle before it, be called, before it was called a side hustle. So I started taking classes at UCLA at night, uh, UCLA at night, uh, the CFP program. And before I was finished with the program, the professor, who was a regional director at Smith Barney, he says, Winnie, you need to go. They're recruiting, and you need to go. It's time. So that's how I got into the financial industry. That's how it would happen. It was quite by accident. I had no clue what financial advisors did. Um, I didn't know a single wealthy person. Um, and really, when they, they hired me, I think they thought, because I knew famous people in television, I really didn't. All I knew is to move people back and forth all day long. And that's how everything started. So to give you an idea of um, that, we're going to segue into today's topic, which is mastering social media. All right? So I'm going to talk to you about building and growing your ideal audience, because you're not leaving me today until you go away like social media rock stars. All right? Because I am not going to waste your time. You're not going to waste my time. I want to make sure that you guys are like just like rocking. And by the time you get out here, out of this room, I want your fingers and thumbs tweeting like there's no tomorrow. OK? First things first, the most important thing. There is nothing like building and growing your ideal audience, people. How many of you can honestly say you have an audience? Yes, you do. Ashley sure does. Many of you. OK, wonderful. I love it. Um, well, what that means is the audience is a beautiful thing. When I worked on Americans Funniest Home Videos, right, we were sitting like this, and it was like cold, too, on this TV st stage. Then someone would come out, and they would warm you up. There's actually a position called a warm-up person. So they would talk to you and mingle with you and let you, get you dancing and moving and get you all happy before Bob Saget, or whoever it was, actually when I was working, it was Davey, Daisy Fuentes, would walk out and start talking to everybody. So I realized that it was all about the audience, right? Without an audience, we are nothing. Would we agree? So I always have the saying, it doesn't matter how good you are at what you do. Like Melissa, probably one of the best financial advisors on the planet, right? But if no one knows that Melissa exists, essentially she doesn't exist, right? Same with Eric, same with Matt, same with everybody else in the room. So we have a responsibility to our families, to our loved ones, to our clients, and to our team to build an audience, okay? So those of you, and I know none of you are in this are in this category because you're putting up with me today, but a lot of people think I don't have time for social media because I don't need to. I just network and they come and they do business with me and my clients give me all my referrals I need. Yeah, and I look like a pigeon, right? Seriously, you have to build it. You know, it ha you have to build this audience. So we're gonna talk about that. Then we're gonna talk about strategizing growth from your content, okay? not just producing content for the sake of producing content. How many of you produce content for the sake of producing content? Thank you for being honest. I was like you for like a couple years. I was like, oh, you want to interview? Yeah, sure, I'll interview you. OK, I'll interview you too. I keep on interviewing. Oh, gosh, I'm in the interview business. How did this happen? Yeah, developing, giving relationships with key press and media. This, you definitely want to take notes. Oh, that being said, I want to share this with you. Don't worry about f feeling like you need to take pictures or doing this. I'm actually going to give you all my slides, OK? So at the end of this, all you need to do is give me your business card and put S on it, or send me an email, and I'll email you everything. So just enjoy and sit back, have fun. Stay warm. <laughs> all right, number four, social media tools. I'm going to give you all the tools that I use. And they're all really inexpensive, because um, I don't want you spending money. Uh, number five, monetizing your brand. When, how, and how much? Okay, we're going to talk about that. 
Okay, so this is my team. There's about 12 of us any given day. Um, but yeah, we have some crazy uh, happy things happen. We, um, people a lot of times will ask me, so who does everything? Our team pretty much consists of about two thirds that are just primarily only on the wealth management side and one third doing content, creative, media. And Curtis in the back is my creative director and he actually travels with me everywhere. We film, vlog, and do all sorts of fun things everywhere we go. All right, that's me. I just want to show it to you only because it's, it's, I know it needs updating. But this way, when you find me on social, you'll know this is who it is in case you know, can't see. All right, so there are no shortcuts for building meaningful relationships. This is my mission. All right. If we're going to make friends, we got to take the time to do so. We all know that. We talk about that all the time. But I want to talk about this in the context of social media. Because oftentimes, our industry tells us that we're very busy and that we're very transactional, right? Or fee-based. But we're looking for someone, either a client or someone to write about us or someone to interview. It's just very quick and dirty. Like, we want to get in there. We want to get you as a client. And if you're not going to be a client, we want to move on. And in social media, you can't be that way. It has to be almost the opposite. It's like as if we were neighbors. How would you treat me if I was your neighbor? Essentially, everybody on social media is your neighborhood. And your neighborhood is getting bigger and faster and happier every single day. I know that from especially these two ladies in back. They do active social media frequently, and every day it's a new person that we're meeting, right? All right. So here's going to be how we're going to develop our audience. Number one thing that I would say for me that's worked, and I hope that it'll work for you too, is to build that social media. The reason I started social media back in the day was actually, this is going to sound funny, but my husband told me about Facebook many, many years ago. I'm like, I'm not doing Facebook. I'm such a private person, and I'm an introvert. I am not going to share anything on Facebook. He's like, OK. So then five years later, I decide I should probably do Facebook. And guess what? I couldn't even get my own name. But social media now has become like a complete different beast for me. And the reason it is is because I ended up having children, multiple beautiful babies. So I have three children. And what I wanted to do is I really wanted to be a mommy. That was like my thing. But I didn't want to give up my business that had grown for so many years, right? And all my amazing clients, and I wanted to continue to grow the practice. Because in my company, I am what they call the rainmaker. I bring money, right? And if I'm having children, I might not be able to bring in as much money. So social media was a way for me to develop this without having to fight LA traffic. That's the truth. I'm a, not that great a driver. All right. So number one thing on social media, many of you know, is to share. A lot of people are in our industry, they do something that I think is sort of an, a brand new thing. And what they do is they use content that's already canned. They'll use content that's been produced for them by their firm or another agency, and then they just share it out. Or they just push out articles from CNBC or you know, MarketWatch, which is great, but it doesn't give your voice. And also, it's very one directional, right? I always say in our industry, in some ways, we're kind of one directional, right? You come to me, you give me your money, I take your money, I invest your money, you pay me fees. It's all about me, really. It's not about you. But, but it actually shouldn't be that way. And social media is a way for it to show that you're not that type of advisor. You're not that type of blogger, that you're actually a giving person. So you want to think about not only sharing, but interacting. And that's critical. Now, this gives you, once you build your audience, somewhere to share your podcast, your videos, your articles, your brand, and eventually to sell. And what do we mean by selling? Well, let's go back. That means webinars, books, co-branding opportunities, TV shows, and all that good stuff, okay? But without an audience, you have nowhere to sell. So you could be producing amazing content, but nobody sees it. I've seen, there's actually a friend of mine, she writes the funniest tweets. I mean, they're hilarious. When I read them, I start to cry sometimes. They're so funny. But she has like 36 followers. I think it's so sad because nobody's seeing her genius unless I share it, right, which I do once in a while. So you've got to build that audience. If you don't build the audience, then nobody will see your genius. And most importantly, when you build your audience, no one can take your audience from you. And that's critical. And, and believe it or not, when you have to ask people uh, to do business with you, that usually means that you haven't done a good enough job building out your brand and your audience. Because when you have, you don't have to ask so much anymore. They'll come and knock on your door, right? Which is really cool. All right. So 
We're gonna go, I'm going a little fast in this part because I'm gonna focus a lot on press and media because that's something I think a lot of people will want to hear about. So platform repurposing. Now whenever you do your content, I want you to ask yourself, what is it that you hope to accomplish with your show? And the reason I use the word show is because if you think about yourself as a TV host or as a television show, you'll see this as a little bit of a different experience. You know many of us produce content, right? We do podcasts and blog articles, but we don't really sit back and just think about who is our defined audience? Who is it that we want to resonate to? And it's usually two different groups. Number one, if you're a financial advisor, and I know many of you in this room are financial advisors, that would be who is your ideal client. So in my case, my clients are generally in the movie and television industry, some in technology. Uh, they tend to be married couples, and I have a lot of power women. You know, so oftentimes it's like attracts like. The second audience you want to think about, and you always want to think in twos. The second audience is who do you want to get the attention of? These people may never be your clients. There's going to be some possible overlap, but this could be like CNBC. This could be Cheddar. This could be your local chamber of commerce. This could be like in my case, I live in a city. Um, called Irvine, which is in Orange County, about 15 minutes from Disneyland in Southern California. And there's what we call, I call her the Oprah of Orange County. Like she knows everybody, everybody. So when I moved to the city and I didn't know anybody, I knew I had to be friends with her. And if I was friends with her, then I would be friends with everybody else. And that's how you do it, right? It's all about centers of influence, but especially on social media. So we wanna figure out who it is that resonates to you and the number one thing with social media, and you're going to promise me you're going to do this because you're with me, right? We're family now. Don't ever change who you are. So be who you are. Like, embrace who you are. Don't be the person that you think will, be, will attract the most amount of money, the most amount of eyeball, who will put you on TV. Don't ever do that. Because if you do that, you will feel physically sick. You want to be yourself and always be yourself. And there's enough people that will love you for who you are, who will want to do business with you, who will embrace you, who will elevate you, and that is your tribe. Okay? So never ever sell yourself out just for the sake of social media, because it just doesn't work. If you feel like, I'll give you an example. Okay, I'm the biggest nerd on the planet. Number one, this is gonna, you're gonna laugh when I tell you this. First of all, I don't drink coffee, because I get like, aw, and I don't drink alcohol. So talk about the most boring person on earth, right? <laughs> really? But at first I was like, oh, I wanna talk about this, right? I don't want to tell you I don't drink coffee. I want to tell you that I don't drink alcohol. And I don't even know how to hold a wine glass or any of that. And also, I'm the most awkward person at a cocktail party. So I, I just am awful. But what I realized is that the more I would share this with people, some people would laugh and think I was crazy. But other people would be like, oh, that's like me. And the great thing is, that's like me is who your tribe is going to be. Hey, that was kind of rhymey. My eight-year-old would be so proud right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so always feel it, realize who you are. So we're going to do a little project. I'm going to have you. I wasn't sure if I had time in this presentation, but I'm just going to fit in anyway, because I think it's great. And I didn't come up with this myself. I borrowed it from my client who owns Influence Tree. But what you do is you get two stacks of Post-its, any color that you want. If it were me, it'd be hot pink and blue. But you can pick your colors. And then on one stack, you're going to write everything that you think about yourself. How you think you project. Like, for example, I might think I project like I'm kind of crazy, right? And I'm kind of geeky. And like sometimes I'm dressed neatly and sometimes I'm not. And, but I'm really real. Like, I, I don't sugarcoat it. It is, I'm just, I want to make sure that you feel good. I'm a natural nurturer. I'm a natural mommy. And then I'll give the other stack to, let, let's say, Curtis, who's my creative director, who, let's say, is, you want to pick someone who's very, very honest, who knows you really well, but it's not going to sugarcoat it. So again, I would not be good, because I tend to sugarcoat. So you would go to someone who's going to tell you who you really are. Then you're going to say, just write about me. Tell me what you think about me. Tell me how I reflect to you. Then you take his stack, or her stack, and you take my stack, and you go to the mirror, and you stick them all up. And you figure out, by combining them, what it is that you think about you and how you're actually reflecting. It's really important to know how you reflect to people, right? It's just not looking in the mirror. So what you think and what they think could be different things. But once you figure out what it is that you're reflecting, then that becomes powerful. Because then that's 
starting at the beginning of building out your personal brand. You figure out at that point who you are, and then you figure out who you're going to attract. And that's the rule of social media. The way to get followers is to have true connections. You could buy followers, you could just copy a bunch of followers, but it's not going to give you that dedicated, raving fan base that you crave. The people, they say in life that you should ideally, in the business life anyway, you should have a thousand raving fans. And a thousand raving fans is, is big. I call them my tribe. I don't have a thousand yet. But these are people who will comment on all your stuff, who will reply to you. When you're having a bad day, they're gonna reach out to you, they're gonna call you, and they will drive two hours to come see you. That's actually the rule. And so you want to get to that point because that's all that matters. If you have 200 raving fans, it's just as powerful as having 50,000 non-raving fan followers, right? Now, don't forget that. Don't worry about the numbers just yet because that's just right now, don't worry about vanity followers. Worry about real followers. But I'm going to teach you how to get the big numbers, too. All right. It'll also help you get a job. It'll also help you get press attention. Now, many of you know I appeared on many shows like CNBC and Cheddar and ABC and Megyn Kelly and all these things like that. But you know how many times somebody has called me because of being on TV that they wanted to be a client? All these major shows, right? Zero. And all of them are like, Really? I'm so surprised. I know, right? It is surprising. Maybe I'm just not that good on TV. No, they just don't. Because nowadays, not that many people watch TV, right? Especially at the times that these shows are on. Plus, like, a lot of my clients don't watch CNBC Closing Bell. That, you know, that's kind of like a show, like a very masculine show. A lot of my clients are like, hi, Winnie, I'm producing this Oscar-winning film. They're not, my clients don't watch CNBC. So because of it, I want you to kind of real recognize the importance of social media. In some ways, social media is more important than being on TV. But I still love being on TV. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to kid you about that. All right. Let's talk about getting press. How many of you would love to get featured in the press? Awesome. And some of you write for the press. So you are on the other side of it. I feel like I can share a little bit of, a little bit of insight on this because I do get interviewed by the media about four times per week, sometimes five times per week. And I've written for Forbes now for about five years. So I feel like I can talk on both sides. So I'm going to share with you my experiences of having worked with a pub uh, several publicists through the years. And this is the best way to do it. Now, number one, many of you are familiar with Haro, right? Have you heard of Haro? OK, great. So a lot of, um, a lot of people have. Haro is a free website that gives you an opportunity to see what the media is interested in. So like, let's say I was writing an article on baby boomers, right? I would put out an inquiry on Haro and say, if you're a specialist in baby boomers, please reach out, because I'd love to talk to you. And then you would send a query to me. Now, that's the positive, because you know I'm looking for you, so you can respond to me. The negative to that is there are 1,000 people that will respond to me on that same exact day. So how do you stand out? Now, this is something that you should pay me for, because really, it's that valuable, and I'm kidding. Um, you want to figure out how to stand out. And the best way to stand out is, obviously, to know your stuff and sometimes to hire a publicist. But you could spend $5,000 a month and get no PR having a publicist. Because the thing that people don't realize is you actually need something more powerful than a publicist before you have your publicist, and that's called a one sheet. How many of you have a one sheet? OK, good. That's a big deal. So what a one sheet is, is a one sheet on you of who you are and what you do. So it'll have your name on top. It'll have your credentials. It'll have your social media numbers that you're following. And the reason the following is important is if you think about it, why is social media so important? Is because when I walk on the stage, like on CNBC or the NASDAQ show I just did, right, what comes with me? all my followers. And when you're competing for airtime and advertisers and whatnot, when you're a television show, you need to bring in audience, right? You need more people watching your show, you know, so your advertiser will keep coming back. So you got to think about this. Social media is absolutely survival. I'm going to get to the question at the end because I tend to over talk. So I'm going to try and finish up in time. So sorry about that. Um, but so really, really critical, OK? So to build that social media following, it has to be on that one sheet. Now, those of you who have never seen what a one sheet looks like, if you want to, you can leave me your car, put an O on it, or email me, and I'll email you mine, and you can take a look at it, and you can use it for yourself and just kind of reword it for you. All right. 
So you want to work, if you're thinking about, how many of you thought about working with a publicist? Yeah, okay. It's a pretty, it's a pretty big investment. I don't, um, I don't really recommend it in the beginning, but I think publicists are worth their weight in gold if you find the right one. And like, I love my publicist. I hug her and love her. Like, she's like the most amazing person on earth. And um, what I would say is, if you find a good one, you got to keep them close. But you have to think like a publicist. You know, they have a, such a difficult time time doing what they do. They have to go out there and get you on TV. They have to go and vouch for you as being the absolute best in your industry, in your area, at any given time. And you're competing with all these other people all across the country for the same airtime. And there's so many great publicists out there. It's, it, some of them have relationships. A lot of people that were ex-CNBC reporters are now publicists. So you've got that competition. So think about their job and think how you can make their job just a little bit easier. Okay, you want to go ahead and follow Google trending news in your respective industry. Super easy. Just go to Google News and figure out what's trending. I actually go to another one I think is even more important is to follow Twitter trends. And the reason that is is a lot of people will say, well, Twitter is so complicated. I don't know if I want to do Twitter. And I get that. I was the same way. I said, my publicist said you should do Twitter. And I said, you're crazy. I don't know. I don't understand. It's so complicated. She's like, I don't care. You got to do it. So I started doing it, and she's absolutely right. And the reason that is is because the media is on Twitter. The following is on Twitter. Everybody's on Twitter. The president's on Twitter. So you got to get on Twitter. And Twitter is where the media is paying attention, and that's where they can catch those shares and those ticks. I'm going to teach you a couple of tricks to make it a little bit easier for yourself, OK? Engage journalists via comments on their articles, sharing their content. And, and that's kind of a no-brainer, but if, like, for example, my Forbes column, you know, I met a lot of people this this conference. I said, oh, I love your Twitter, um, your Forbes pieces. I'm like, really? I didn't know because I really didn't know because you never commented. So I had no idea who you were and I feel bad, but I, I would love to know. But if you comment, we do see for good or bad, you know, and if you share even better. So whenever I see someone share my articles on Forbes and they tag me on it, I always give public thanks, and I always share for them. And what's nice about that is when I do that, it helps um, increase your clout score. And those of you who do social media probably know the value of clout. Clout is something people talk about being valuable, not valuable. It's very controversial. I don't know if it's valuable or not, but I do know that people still pay attention to it. So you might as well pay attention to it uh, at any given day. My clout's about 80. Um, it took me a while to get there, but there's ways that you can do this. So you definitely want to engage with journalists with them as much as possible. And then most importantly, and this is coming from someone who, who writes, um, make my job easy. This is something that was told to me from a producer at ABC. When do you make my job easy, OK? You want to do that college planning piece? Great. Find me a family, find me a student, and you can be in it. How does that sound? I'm like, all right. So think about it that way. You want to plan these stories, pretend that you're producing a show, and wrap the whole thing up. And don't be it about only you, OK? Leverage the people that you know. For example, if you went to a show and you said, hey, I want to do a piece on Black Friday, right? I've got Target for you, got me for you, and I've got, I don't know, a, a, a parent that's going to be shopping for Christmas. You just made the reporter shop really easy. Now, they might not use you still, but they now know that you're in it there to help them make their job just a little bit easier. Because these days, reporters, and I work with, um, I've got almost over 100 clients from the Los Angeles Times, that are my longtime clients. And I tell you, they're also stressed out because their industry is being, being um, monopolized by all of us, right? Bloggers and podcasts and content creators. So the traditional media is having a hard time. To, to keep their job so they don't only really have to fill spots for their show, they gotta do other things, they gotta do other channels and other outlets. So they're not getting paid a lot. So if you stress them out, they're just gonna be your worst enemy. So make their job super, super easy. And this is a really, really big thing. You want to thank them, like Profusi thank them. Thank them like you should thank your mother. How should you thank your mother? I don't know about you, but I got like one, one Chinese mother who I love her, she's incredible, but I'm like never perfect, like never okay with her. Either too fat or too this or too, everything's wrong every single day. But think about that. So think, how do you think a person like that, right? So you can't give them, don't, you can't send them gift cards and all this stuff, can't do that. But you can thank them in a way that, that means something to them. Number one, you can thank them publicly on social media, which costs you nothing but a little bit of time, right? 
And then you should thank them with something special, maybe from something from your hometown, something small. I like to send toffee, that's my thing, because my girlfriend makes the most amazing um, toffee and she sells it and she can't keep it in stock. So I send them her toffee, okay? So that's what we do. Okay, now we're gonna talk about social media broadcasting. So let's talk about Twitter, because that's what I'm going to focus on a little bit more than anything. People always ask me, where do I get clients from? I get clients from all the social media channels now. It's incredible. I first started on LinkedIn, but I guess before we get into Twitter, we'll talk about LinkedIn just briefly. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Amazing. How many of you tweaked your bio in the last three months? Great. In the last month? Very good. Very good. Heads of the class. Valedictorian. <laughs> Those are my Asian classmates. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Because in rule number one on uh, LinkedIn, right, the picture's got to look amazing, all right? You got to have a big smiley face. I want to see teeth. I want to see good lighting. And I want to see a plain background. Nothing too crazy. You don't have a plant sticking out of your head or anything like that, OK? You want to do that. An iPhone works amazingly well for this, or any smartphone will work just fine. If you don't have a cardio like I do, take a picture with your smartphone and do that. If you don't have professional lighting, look towards the open window when the window is shining towards you. Have the photographer stand by the window and take shots of you. Okay? The picture needs to look really clear and really crisp. And if you're not happy with it, test the picture. Put the picture on and see how many followers you get, how frequently, and if it doesn't work, change it. All right? The other thing on your bio, don't make it all about business. Some of my U U UBS friends out here, I, I talked to you earlier, I love UBS, but some of you have really like serious bios. That doesn't really work so well on LinkedIn. We want to see some personality. Um, like for example, in my bio it says, never met an avocado I didn't like. So I really love avocados from California, right? But give something that out there that makes me want to call you. Your bio should be so sexy that if I don't connect with you, I'm an idiot. And if it doesn't feel that way, you have to change it. And why, how you can test this concept is if you extend invitations to 100 people and only 10 people accept your connection, you got a problem. Okay? You should be getting at least 50% of the people that you extend invitations to should connect back with you. If they don't, you need to keep on tweaking that bio. And if you want to, you can look at my bio and you can see how I did it. I basically put it out there. It's like I threw up. Bleh. This is everything I do that I could do with you. So there's got to be something you can find in connection for me. I'm not saying it's like the perfect, but perfect bio, but I do have, a, a, I have had a lot of success on LinkedIn. And to give you an idea, many of you have heard the um, podcast, look, some of the podcasts or shows I've done recently, but I probably brought in um, more than $50 million just on LinkedIn alone in new assets for those financial advisors out there. Okay, um, and now we're going to move to Facebook. Facebook has also given me seven, eight figures as well. And Facebook I'm not as keen on because my clientele isn't all on Facebook. But that's OK. I'm still on there, because there's going to be some people on there. And I get to meet all of you on the FinCon uh, page, which is awesome. Now, Twitter. Twitter, though, is where I want to focus some energy on. We know that Twitter currently has a restriction of 140 characters, right? How many of you tweeted this morning? Oh, good job. All right, good. So Twitter is really, really great, right? Because you can tag people. And those of you who tweet, you should know the secret formula is always to include an image, image or video, right? My ladies in front, they totally know this. Video speaks higher than anything else. But I would say I actually prefer pictures over video. And the reason that is, is on pictures, you can tag 10 people, right? And why is that important? Because you can garner the attention of who you want to pay attention to. For example, before getting on the plane here, right, I posted I was in the airport, I took a picture of the airport, and I tagged that I was coming to Dallas, and I tagged about six people that I thought would be ideal to meet, Texas Instruments, like the, the neighborhood news, whoever else in Texas that would be great to meet. And then I tagged about three to four of what I call my tribe, my people. My people that I know that will share and reply to everything that I tweet. Okay, and we'll put my tweet on fire. Now, I just want to give an idea. I don't 
have a program that I can sell to you on this. This is just everything that I do that I just want to share with you, okay? So this is my kind of secret sauce, if you will. So if I tweet something and nobody reacts to it, that tweet was just a waste to tweet. And that's not good. I need that tweet to move. So what you do is you make friends, like right, the Ashies of the world that have good followings, right? And what you do is you have this relationship when they share, you share. When you share, they share. So what I'll do is I'll put this on. I'll tag, I tag JetBlue or Ted American or Southwest Airlines, whoever is in, in Dallas that I want to get the attention. Then I put my posse at the end. And they move that tweet. So during this conference, for the last four or five days, this tweet's been moving back and forth. We're having conversations about the, And it's because I help them, they help me. Got it? So 10 people you can tag. All right, you're welcome to tag me. Don't overdo it, or I'll tell you. But that's what you want to do, OK? That is your army, your tribe, your family that will help you move. And get a little adventuresome. So let's say you want to get the attention of the Wall Street Journal. Tag the Wall Street Journal. They're paying attention, you know? Tag a reporter, even better. Many, many of my reporter friends are at this conference, this, uh, this trip, and a lot of them have interviewed me. They're like, Winnie, thank you so much for sharing that article we did together. I'm like, absolutely, I will share it to the end of time, and I'll show you a trick to do that. So that's the thing, you know, reporters are all about viewerships on their articles, so you wanna try to get them as many views to their article as humanly possible. Okay, now we're gonna talk about collaborations. And this is kind of with the media, but this is everything else. So some of you are saying, like, how do I get more followers? I'm gonna to touch on this right now. So those of you who wanna get more followers, guess what? It's really, really simple. To get more followers, you need to follow other people. Right, so what that means is there's, there's a rule in life, right? You scratch my back, I will scratch your back. So if you're just sitting there like an island waiting for people to follow you, no one's gonna follow you, right? And also it makes you look kind of selfish too. So actually, you gotta go out there and follow people. And then the nice ones will follow you back. And guess what? If they don't follow you back in a couple weeks, unfollow them. No big deal, right? And there's tools that help you do this. And we're gonna get to that. I'm gonna give you my whole list of all my tools that you can just, you can have that. And always think in multiples. Find out who in your community has a lot of followers. And you can figure out pretty quick who the nice people are because when you tweet them, they actually respond. Those are nice people, right? Figure out the collaborations. How many of you um, watch YouTube? There's this really funky channel called Strictly Dumpling. Has anybody heard of this channel? Nobody's heard of this channel, okay. Well, obviously not a good example, but I'm gonna tell you it anyway. So there's this guy named Mike Chen, right? He has this channel called Strictly Dumpling. He has over two million combined subscribers on YouTube. I mean, he's like a YouTube god, if you will, right? He makes his living off YouTube, and he has a team of eight people that work for him, and all they do is travel the world and eat, and they get paid to travel and eat and get filmed. It's like the most amazing thing. Well, guess what? His community and my community are completely different, right? But when I went to New York to, for media appearances, I reached out to him and I said, hey, Mike, I'd like to see if you might want to eat with me. And he says, okay, I'll eat with you. So we went to eat and we became friends. And guess what? Now we collaborate. We share friends with each other. Because people see us online talking to each other, just like we would text each other on the phone because we're buddies, right? But we're doing it publicly on Twitter. And guess what? People like nice people. That's like a really marvelous thing. So if you're nice to him, he might be nice to you, and then you might be nice to Ashley, and Ashley might be nice to you, and Melissa might be nice to you, and all of a sudden we're building our audiences by collaborating, and we get a ton of new followers that way. When we became friends, Mike and I, in one week, he got an extra 1,000 followers. And he only had 11,000 followers on Twitter to start when I first met him, and he went through 1,000 in a week, so for him, that's a big thing. On, on Twitter, because his, his was on YouTube. And similarly, unfortunately, YouTube, you can't you know, collaborate as well that way, but this is why Twitter is so powerful. So figure out in your community who has big reach. And here's a little trick for you. Ashley knows this really well. You can test to see who has fake followers and who has real followers. It's called, um, it's Twitter audit, right? Twitter, twitteraudit.com. It's a free service. You can go in there and test. So if you find someone that you think you want to come, um, collaborate with, you might want to check to make sure the followers are real. Sometimes you meet somebody with two million followers and guess what? Like, 
90% of them are fake. So not a good use of your time because you don't want to be associated with someone with fake followers because it actually could diminish your brand if you do too much um, collaborating with them, right? Because it makes it look like you're actually helping someone who's not real. Not a good thing. All right. Um, next thing you want to do is join things like Ashley and I do, which are Twitter chats. Twitter chats are a great way to meet people, really, really nice people. And what it is is just a public chat where you go on on Twitter on any defined amount of time and you have conversations with people. Like, for example, I actually own the largest financial Twitter chat in all of social media. Okay, so every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, you can go on Twitter, follow hashtag Winnie Sun, and we uh, average about 200 million impressions per hour. To give you, how, give you an idea how big that is, that actually um, beats the top performing shows on most networks. That's how many impressions during one hour. It's insane. So during that time, you get a lot of people who are interested in getting to know you on social media at the same time at that place. Okay? And from there, you can pick up a hundred, hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of followers. Another trick for you, like attracts like, right? So if you're not sure how to get followers or even who to follow, think about who you are similar to. Okay? I'll give you an example. My friend Mike, he does these foodie videos, right? Um, he's Asian, he's Chinese, and um, I was thinking about him for a little bit. I'm like, hmm, where would I find the right followers for Mike? Well, guess what? I was like, well, who else is popular and sort of has somewhat of a connection to him? Hmm. Well, not connected to him, but sort of reminds me of him a little way. Jeremy Lin, right? They're both Asian. They're sort of kind of really in social media. So guess what? I told him to follow all the followers of Jeremy Lin, and guess what? It worked. He picked a whole bunch of followers that already knew him, but didn't know that he was active on Twitter. So that's what you do. So let's say you live in, hmm, let's see. What is a fun place that we talked about today with one of you? Hmm. Let's see, Nebraska. So let's say you're in Nebraska, right? You figure out who in your area, who has a good following, who's really well known, and you go to who's following them, because it's all public information, and follow everybody that follows them. And then right before you do that, make sure your profile says Nebraska. Make sure you put up a picture of Nebraska, of something everybody knows. Like, for example, if you were in Dallas, you should post a picture of that big eyeball, right? So then that way I know when you're, like, following me and I'm in your hometown that I should follow you back because we have something in common. We both live in the same place. And if I'm doing business, I should know you. And if I don't, then I'm actually not a very nice person, so you shouldn't follow me anyway, right? So that's the thing. You're collecting nice people. You're not collecting people just for the sake of collecting people. Now, how many people should you be following per day? The rule of thumb is 998 people per day. And that's because, as of right now in Twitter land, if you are not verif verified yet and you exceed 1,000 people, you're going to get blocked. And Twitter's going to shut you down for like a couple days. And you're going to be like, ah, what happened, Winnie? I can't even use Twitter. Well, they're mad at me. And they're, no, they're not. They're just they're going to stop you because they're thinking you're going to abuse the system by you know, working the system. So what you're going to do is you're going to work up to 998 followers per day. And then the next day, you're going to follow another 998 people per day. And you're going to do this every single day. And sometimes when I'm like just too tired to do it, I actually have my phone to my eight-year-old or my six-year-old, six almost six-year-old. Here, honey. Like, the, yeah, it's a really long drive to Disney now. Here. Do, 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 do. And he'll just say, do, do. oh, mommy, this says the, it's okay, just, just follow, just follow. <laughs> so, and that's what you do. You just let them follow, follow, follow. You could, that's the only job you should have an intern do for you, by the way, on social media. That's the only job. Everything else you should do by yourself. Because, for example, if you have someone else handling your social media, like if I were to have somebody else handle my social media, and I come to conference, and I meet Echo, and Echo's like, I've been tweeting you, I'm like, hi, who are you? It's really bad, right? And that happens all the time. A lot of big social media influencers don't handle their own social, and it will bite you in the butt. So don't do it. If you're going to do it, do it yourself and do it right. Okay? Like I said, because we are not the same person. They might love my intern, but they might not love me. This, this, actually is, this is actually a true story. There was one time I was actually tied up on an all-day like, conference for two days. So I said, okay. And Shannon on my team, she's like, oh, Winnie, it's okay. I can handle it for you for a little bit. I'm like, okay. She posted a picture of potato chips. I'm like, Shannon, my audience doesn't like potato chips. That doesn't resonate with my brand. It makes no sense. Oh, really? I love potato chips. So that just gives you an idea. Totally harmless, totally okay, but understand you're building a brand, not just tweeting for the sake of tweeting. Everything is to raise you up, okay? So always think about raising up. 
Always collaborate with people that you think are bigger than you. And believe it or not, they probably aren't. They're probably just as important as you. Okay, so know your goal, but always know their goal. That's number one rule in social media or media, right? Always know what their goal is. It really honestly doesn't matter so much of your goal at that given moment. At that time, what is most important to you? Like I work with several brands. Like I've worked with Capital One, like Aflac, Triple Tax, they sponsor me, I'm the spokesperson or whatever. I always figure out what it is that they want to do. Do they want more people to buy their product? Do they want more people to check out their website? Figure out what that goal is. If you figure out what that goal and you're able to collaborate with them to try to help them become more successful, you will always benefit from that either today or tomorrow. It's karma, social media karma, in-person karma, all types of karma, just karma in general, right? So always do that. And like attracts like. So if you do that, if you become truly giving on social and in person, guess what? The people that are going to be in your community are going to be just as caring and giving as well. All right. Think of who would gravitate to you and if this is a marketing attract opportunity. And then, again, remember your LinkedIn, all your bios need to be super, super sexy. All right, personal branding story. Let me check the time real quick so I know. Okay, cool, we're right at the time. So, I'm gonna actually give you this slide real quick. This are, these are my favorite tools for social media, okay? And I will happily send this to you if you like. But these are all my tools. Each of them that I use, I think, is less than $100 per year. The very bottom one is not a, not a social media tool. Actually, my client owns that company. It's called Recon Group. And the reason I bring them up is they have a whole social media influencer platform. So let's say, for example, you have a company. Let's just say all of you are individual brands, right? So let's say your brand is in financial planning or, or financial coaching. And you want to sell t-shirts or cups or whatever. Guess what? You don't actually have to print it and store it in your office. You actually set up a relationship with Recon and what they do is actually um, they will print your stuff when people order it and then they'll just send you your cut. It's like the most beautiful thing and it's very eco-friendly too. So very, very inexpensive to do. All right. And then so this is something I'll leave with you because all of us came from somewhere. We're all meaningful in our own way and we're, you, you're all wonderful in your own way and you're most beautiful people. So I'm, just remember, remember your value and don't second guess yourself and project it out there. Let people know just how amazing you are because if you don't tell them, no one's gonna tell them. And this is me. This is how you can reach out to me if you wanna connect with me, I actually do, like now you know, I actually answer my own social media. And um, this is how we can connect. 